Okay, so in this video, we're just going to uh, get our first look at inclined planes and see what happens when we have some mass sitting on a surface which is not level, meaning it's not horizontal to uh, the ground as we normally think about it. But instead, what we have is we have this inclined plane. So it's going up as it's going over. It has some slope. The plane is at an angle theta to the ground, so this would be the normal ground that we would think about being level. Um, we're going to have essentially a triangle, where we have an angle theta, we have a right angle, there's some other angle here that we're not really concerned with, and our mass sits right on the plane. So if we're going to look at all the forces first that act on the mass, we're on the Earth. So of course we know that there is a weight or a force due to gravity, and that always points directly towards the Earth. Then, since we are on a surface, we're going to have a normal force. And the definition of the normal force is that it points perpendicular to, normal to, out of a surface. All right, so this is much different than what we're used to seeing. We're used to seeing the normal force pointing the opposite direction as gravity. That is not the definition of a normal force. A normal force points out of a surface. If there is no surface, there is no normal force. And a lot of times we're going to be dealing with a force of friction. Uh, very rarely is there a surface which we can truly assume is frictionless. Sometimes we're going to make assumptions that this is a frictionless plane when we do a practice problem. Uh, but a lot of times we're going to see a force of friction. And if you just think about it logically, if I put a ball on this, or if this were frictionless and this mass were resting on the plane, what would happen? It would want to go down the plane. All right, you trip on a hill, you're going to roll down the hill. That's just what happens. And so friction always wants to oppose that motion. So friction is going to be pointing up the hill. If this mass were at rest, all of these forces would have to equal zero. They would all cancel out. Or if the mass was moving at a constant velocity, again, the net force would have to be zero. They would have to all cancel out. So now we're going to look at this. We're going to say it's at rest just for the purposes of uh, what we're drawing right here. And what we need to do is we need to pick a coordinate axis. And what we're going to do is we're going to choose a coordinate axis such that one of our axes lies parallel to the plane and the other one is perpendicular to it. By doing this, we've made it so that the parallel axis has the force of friction acting along it and the perpendicular axis has the normal force acting along it. Additionally, what's nice about this is if this mass did start sliding down the plane, it would now be sliding or moving in a direction that puts it right on this axis, so we wouldn't have to resolve that at all. So looking at this, it's clear that the only force that doesn't lie on one of these axes is our force due to gravity or our weight. So this is the only force we're going to have to resolve in this case. When we do that, we need to draw a y component or a perpendicular component. So I've labeled this my y-axis now and this my x-axis. I'm going to call this positive for the time being. I'll call this positive for the time being. I might change that in other problems. Um, so again, this weight has to have a y-component and it has to have an x-component. We should be used to by now that any vector can be resolved into two component vectors that are at right angles. By doing this, we now have two components of weight that act parallel to these axes. In other words, they lie on the axes. So this x points right down the plane. So over here, I'm just going to draw this again with, uh, without the plane being in the way. So we've got our y-axis, we've got our x-axis. And what happens is this FGX can be thought of as acting right here on this mass. The FGY can be thought of as acting right there. So this FGX would be what causes the mass to actually want to move down the plane. 
it's the x component or the parallel component because it's parallel to the plane and if you were to roll a ball down the plane roll a ball down the hill trip on a hill roll down the hill it's that component of gravity that accelerates you down the hill so finishing out this diagram over here I still got my force of friction and I'm gonna have my normal force and lo and behold the problem has just got really simple because all of our forces now lie on an axis. Again, I've labeled this my y and I've labeled this my x. The next important thing, which we can prove uh, using geometry, but we're not going to in this video, is that this angle theta turns out is this angle theta. All right, this is a 90 degree triangle, just like this is a 90 degree triangle. They have to be similar triangles. This is the similar angle. So by extension, we can rewrite this FGX and this FGY as components of this triangle where our weight, our FG, is our hypotenuse. So the X component is opposite, making it the sine function. And then what I've done is I've broken down my FG, my weight, into another expression for FG, which is MG. So now there's two ways we can think of this. All right, we can calculate it. If we're given a weight already, we can just multiply that weight by sine of theta, and we'll get this X or parallel component. Again, that's the component that makes this slide down the plane. But if we're not given our weight, if we're just given our mass, it's simple enough because we know that on the Earth, our acceleration due to gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared, and so it's not a hard equation either way. Our y component now is the cosine, because cosine means adjacent. So if I'm looking for my y component, it's simply the weight times cosine of theta. Again, I can rewrite that as mg cosine of theta. Now, normally, we're not used to our x component being sine and our y component being cosine because normally when we draw a triangle like this big one, the opposite of this angle tends to be the y. It's important to remember that sine does not mean we're using our y. Cosine does not mean we're using our x. Sine is the ratio of the opposite over the hypotenuse. And cosine is the ratio of the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. So because our angle is up here, the opposite is the x component. So the opposite ends up being sine. The x component ends up being sine. And the adjacent is our y component. So our y component ends up being cosine. The biggest mistake that I often see is that students automatically go, oh, this is y. It must be times the sine of theta. So if we can remember how to draw a triangle, we shouldn't have any issues at all.